afternoon, everybody. Um, since this is the last session um, of the conference, I, I figured I'd actually take some time to look at the broader problem. And it's not necessarily maybe, maybe even outline some of the solutions. There's certainly going to be practical and hands-on tips for the kinds of things you can do. But also kind of a call to action for what do we need to do or what we can do, what, what kinds of problems we still need to solve as a community to, uh, to get the millisecond uh, barrier for mobile or break it uh, for 1,000 milliseconds. And the first question that you should ask is like, what's so special about 1,000 milliseconds, right? Like here's a random number you just picked out of your head and like now all of a sudden we need to fulfill this criteria. Well, it turns out that it, it's definitely true that speed and performance are relative metrics, right? There's such thing as a fast enough. And it really depends on your context. But uh, despite that, if we do user studies and basic, just look at the uh, user studies done in the 90s, in 2000s, it doesn't matter if it's for a desktop app, for a native app, for a mobile app. Like we have these perceptual constants that are just associated with us, right, with us humans. And basically what we find is uh, reaction times below. So if you respond to a user within 100 milliseconds, it just feels instant. Like you, most users won't notice a thing. Uh, somewhere between 300 milliseconds, it starts to kind of feel, you know, something's going on, like a sticky button. Like it's, it's a hard thing to describe, but you, you kind of know it when you feel it. And then basically after one second, there's this uh, mental context switch. You click a button, something, hap something is hopefully happening, uh, and then you go like, oh, I gotta email Bob, and I gotta talk to Sherry, and before you know it, you're like on to the next thing, right? So to, to have an app that feels instant, that you keep the user engaged, and that's ultimately what we're after, right? Whether that's a native app, whether that's a web page, what have you. We want to keep the user engaged and in flow. Right? So that's why I'm picking this uh, 1,000 millisecond barrier. And ideally, every navigation on the web should be under that. Right? It's just fluid. You search for something, you land on a page, you click on that, it, it renders within uh, 1,000 milliseconds, you click on the next link. And that's the kind of experience that we want to get to. So ideally, of course, you know, you'd be even faster. And I'm all in favor of that. But let's just start with this kind of concrete goal of 1,000 milliseconds and work backwards. Like, what are the challenges? What are the technical challenges? of actually doing a page render on the web today in 1,000 milliseconds. And uh, if we break it down, like let's, let's go from the basics, right? Here's one that I think most of us just completely miss entirely, but I think this is really interesting. So hardware input latency. It turns out it actually takes some time to register. Like when you, when you tap on your phone, there's latency associated with registering on the physical layer that something has happened. And here's a study from uh, Agawi that was, that was recently published when they looked at some of the more popular handsets on the market right now. So it turns out that iPhone 5 takes, on average, 55 milliseconds to register the touch event. This is at the physical layer, right? If you look at uh, some of the other, so iPhone 4 is about 85 milliseconds, and uh, some of the other Android devices, you know, you're looking at 100 milliseconds. So this is not an exhaustive list, but it kind of gives you a range, right? So we're talking somewhere between 50 to 100 plus milliseconds just to register the touch. Like we're not even talking about triggering a navigation in the browser. So that's a problem, right? And that's something that we can iterate on. This is something that uh, we need to get better at in terms of manufacturing touch screens. Like I think uh, clearly the iPhone is doing much better than some of the other device manufacturers here. And the question is why, right? And that's something that we should demand better performance on. Now that we've registered that, uh, that event, we actually need to figure out what kind of input it is, right? We have different ge gestures on our devices. And in order to figure that out, we also need to add some software latency because we don't know if you're going to pinch and zoom, if you're going to do you know, some swipe simulation or some, some swipe action, I should say. Um, so what we do is basically say, like, OK, we've registered the first touch event. We're going to wait. Let's pick a number, 300 milliseconds. Sounds good and see what happens next, right? Like, like are you going to put the second finger down and trigger some action? So 300 milliseconds later, we say, no, 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 it wasn't a pinch zoom. So we'll, tr we'll trigger the fire, or we'll trigger the click event at that point. So if you do the math, that's already 350 to 400 milliseconds that have gone by. And we are yet to perform anything meaningful at like page layer, right? We just triggered the click event. So we're almost halfway through our budget, 400 milliseconds, which is terrible news. Now, there is an optimization that you can do. So for example, in uh, modern browsers, you can specify this meta name viewport. And you can actually say, user scalable no. And that basically says that it's an overwrite. It disables pinch zoom on your browser. Uh, in order, if you are doing this, you also need to optimize your site such that 
uh, the user shouldn't be, shouldn't need to zoom, I should say, right? Um, and if you disable zoom, it basically disables the software latency. And it's, it's, it basically says the first time you, uh, on the first event, fire the click event. So don't add this extra 300 milliseconds. So this is a practical thing that you can put into your site today and immediately eliminate 300 milliseconds of uh, latency on every single click, which is uh, great. Uh, for older browsers, there are JavaScript polyfills. These are well known. You can find a whole bunch. Fast click is a popular one. And uh, right now, actually, on the Chrome team, we're, we're looking into uh, basically building in an even more aggressive strategy, uh, trying to figure out, do we even need to really uh, ask uh, the website developers to put in this viewport user scalable? No. Are there other cases where we can just do it on your behalf? Because we can't educate every web developer out there, and we want to make this faster. So this is something that you can apply on your site today. This is a massive win. But as I said, right, this is almost 400 milliseconds later. So Thankfully, you can address the first 300 milliseconds if you do proper mobile design. You can disable some of the zooming. And of course, you know, we can have a separate conversation for whether you should be disabling zooming or not. This is why we're trying to figure out on the Chrome side as to whether we can be more intelligent. So now that we know that you've clicked something, let's say you've clicked on a link, uh, we need to fire off some packets right, to, get, to get the data uh, off the internet. So the phone happens to have been idle for a little while, so the radio is off. Uh, so the first thing that happens on a mobile network is we actually need to talk to the carrier and say, hey, I would like to transmit some data, and can you please give me permission to do so? And give me a specific time uh, when I can transmit this data. Turns out that's kind of this uh, part on the, uh, in the red here. That's known as the control plane latency, and this latency actually varies based on the generation type of network. Uh, some numbers here. You can see that for the latest generation networks, it's about 100 milliseconds. And this is kind of optimistic. This is good stuff. The trouble is, for the older generation networks, this can take up to seconds, two and a half seconds in some cases, in the old generation networks, uh, which, of course, is terrible news, right? Basically, what it means is it is going to take me two seconds, let's say, to talk to the tower to get permission to send data. So uh, good luck uh, with, the, that, with that one, uh, one second barrier, right? So. It's getting much better, but nonetheless, it's something you need to be aware of, right? Basically, what it says is if the device has been idle, if the radio is off, you're going to incur this. You don't incur this every single time. It's just when the radio first wakes up. So it's one of those things. It's just like a DNS lookup, right? You don't do a DNS lookup every single time you need to make a request. But the first time you make that lookup, it's going to cost you. So similarly, this is something you should take into account when you design your app. And this happens every time the radio wakes up. Great. So we've gotten our assignment, right? We've gotten as far as we've talked to the tower. The tower gave us permission. Now we can finally send some data, right? And we can send that HTTP GET request. Well, OK. Now it gets tricky. Now you look at the carrier network. And uh, we actually need to route the packet through the carrier network and out to the public internet, right? And if you dig deep enough into the FAQs of you know, AT&T, Sprint, and all the other providers, you will find latency numbers in there. Uh, they never advertise them. But they are there. So, for example, for AT and T, uh, the LTE network. This is like your, you know, the best network that you can get. Forty to fifty milliseconds. Forty to fifty milliseconds is like doing a round trip from here to New York, uh, from here to sorry, London and back to New York, right? Like that's that's quite a while, uh, and that's the best case. And if you go into older generation networks, most of the time when we say 4G, we actually mean HSPA plus or rather not we, the marketing departments of the, uh, of the carriers. So basically what you're looking at, at is somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. This is just the time it takes from the tower to the edge of the public network. right? And then we also have to route it to your server. So then your server comes in, and you, where you position your server actually makes a big difference. So roughly speaking, you're looking at 50 milliseconds to half a second in the worst case. Right? And the thing to keep in mind here as well is that uh, mobile networks are heterogeneous. Right? There's, we cover networks of different, there's different generations being deployed all the time. Your phone is actually migrating between different networks. Like the 4G network may have poor coverage, specifically in this area. Your phone will fall back to an older generation 3G network. So even, even though you have a 4G plan here, doesn't mean that you're always on 4G and you're always going to get this latency. And then there's a whole bunch of other factors. So, OK, so that's another couple hundred milliseconds. And of course, um, all, the only thing we've done here is we've started 
we've initiated the initial transfer of the data, right? We have not yet talked about CSS, JavaScript, and anything of the like. We're just doing like the first lookup. Specifically, if this is a new page, we've just sent the first UDP packet for, for a DNS lookup, right? Beautiful. You get that back, you do this, uh, the TCP connect, right? That's another round trip. You go through that whole uh, cycle again, then finally we can send the HTTP request, and then finally we wait for your server, we download you know, a first few bytes of the HTML. Uh, that's pretty awesome. And I'm not showing the TLS, but if you handshake here, but if you're running over a secure connection, those are, there's another one or two round trips in here, right? So all of this to highlight that there's a lot of round trips here, and there's a lot of latency in the network that we need to account for. To make this concrete, right, let's actually look at a 40 kilobyte file. And I'm going to be very optimistic, and I'm going to say, like, imagine we're in a nice, fast 4G connection. Uh, my carrier is giving me five megabits per second, which sounds awesome. And we're going to open a new connection and just fetch 40 kilobytes of HTML, right? We do a full round trip to establish the TCP connection. We send the, uh, the get request. The server takes some time to generate the response. Uh, here I'm just kind of picking a number out of the hat, 200 milliseconds. Sounds reasonable. Um, we get some data back. Uh, because, because of the way the TCP works, you can't send the entire file back. You send a little bit of that data. In this case, you can send uh, first 10 segments, which happens to be around 15 kilobytes. Uh, the client then acknowledges that data, and uh, the server then sends the rest. So if you do the math, basically, we've done three round trips to fetch this 40 kilobyte file, and we've spent 700 milliseconds. And notice that the bandwidth part here makes, like, it's nowhere in the equation, right? It's a ceiling that you can get to, but right now, after 700 milliseconds, uh, our bandwidth is uh, basically, let's see, 40 kilobits, or 40 kilobytes, sorry. 40 kilobits would be sad. Although 40 kilobytes is also sad. So three round trips, 700 milliseconds, right? This is pretty awesome, at which point you should start or you should stop and pause and be like, wait a second, right? Like, have you been track keeping track of all of the latencies I've been describing so far? How the hell are we going to get below 1,000 milliseconds with everything I've just said, right? Like, this is starting to look pretty bad. Here's a quick summary table of everything we've talked so far. So we've talked about hardware input latency. We've talked about software input latency. You can fix the software input latency, and you should fix software input latency. The control plane stuff, this is just your radio waking up. This is a one-time cost. Nothing we can do about it. Uh, hopefully, the networks will get faster. Uh, good stuff. DNS is something certainly you can optimize. You know, there's plenty of vendors at this event that will sell you faster DNS uh, service. TCP connection, same thing, right? Uh, this is where using something like a CDN can help quite a bit because basically by reducing the round trip time to your server, you're reducing the overall latency. So once again, TLS, optimizing TLS, uh, lots of work here that could be done. Uh, it's an un unoptimized frontier for the most part. And then finally to uh, fetch 40 kilobytes, you know, we need another three round trips. So you add all that up and you kind of take the best case and the worst case scenario. And what you end up with is on a 3G uh, connection, and I'm kind of picking this average 200 millisecond round trip time for 3G, you basically end up at one second. This is your best case scenario. This is the case where we already have uh, an active radio, we don't have to do it uh, a TCP, or sorry, a TCP handshake, we're basically reusing a connection. So it is possible, technically, right? It's hard, and more likely than not, you're gonna exceed the one second barrier, but with 4G, as we move to 4G, and the adoption in 4G in North America is actually uh, ahead of the curve of anywhere else in the world, which is great news for once um, in North America. So that's good, right? And, and it actually gets us in the roughly the right ballpark. But nonetheless, right, knowing what we know, uh, we've just, well, this is just the data for the first 40 kilobytes of the HTML. So what I'm saying here, implicitly, is that you should be able to render something useful to the user in the first 40 kilobytes of HTML. And that in itself is a tricky problem, right? How you do that is uh, a long conversation, in part because our pages are not just HTML, right? We also have, not, first of all, we don't have just one HTML file. Uh, in many cases, we fetch multiple HTML files because we have iframes and widgets and other things. We have CSS, we have images, we have JavaScript, and this is uh, some numbers that I'm pulling from HTTP Archive. So this is based on the mobile uh, data set where we scan the top uh, 5,000, I believe, mobile sites right now. 
and uh, I'm pulling the medians. And you can see here that we're the median for a mobile site is about 23 images, three HTML files, eight JavaScript files, and two CSS files. All you know combined, the median size is about 400k. And you see the distribution here, right? There's uh, thankfully the sites are you know tend to be clumped uh, along the smaller towards the smaller size, and then we get into sites that have multi megabyte. Um, total size. So that's the problem that we're actually up against. So there, there are three broad um, things that I think we need to think about when we try to tackle this problem. One is, clearly, uh, we're spending a lot of time on these round trips. So anything and everything we can do to optimize our network stacks, to either eliminate those round trips or to shorten those round trips, is a big win. Right. So that's part one. Part two is we need to think about this idea of a critical rendering path. I've already hinted at this idea, which is you should be able to render something very quickly with partial content, the first 40 kilobytes. So that's what I mean by critical rendering path, and we'll see an example shortly. And then finally, uh, we don't necessarily have to, uh, we can change the rules of the game. Uh, we can predict, right? Like if, if you know that I'm on step two and the next step two that HTML and the next page is step three or the checkout or the thank you page, perhaps we can prefetch some of that content ahead of time such that by the time you click on that link, we already have it in the cache, right? So we can cheat at this game. And in fact, browsers do this to a great extent today already on your behalf. We try to predict as much as we can, right? This is what makes Chrome and other browsers as fast as it is. Uh, but you guys can help too because you have the knowledge of the app itself. You have the context of the user. You know where the user is heading. We can just kind of play games in the background based on historical data analysis, right? So all three of these are important strategies. So first, let's look at the network. Uh, this is a really interesting test uh, that was actually done by one of the um, engineers on the Blink team uh, or Chrome team. So the test here is we ran the top 1 million Alexa sites. Uh, this is actually based on a cable profile with a 28 millisecond round trip time. So this is really good, right? Like we're talk we're if we're talking mobile, you really should be uh, the RTT should be way higher than this. But despite that fact, basically what we wanted to say, or what we want to, we want to measure, I should say, is see where does the time on the actual thread in Blink go? Like when we render these pages. Are we spending a lot of time parsing JavaScript, executing JavaScript, waiting for the network, doing painting, layout, and all the rest? And the takeaway here is 70% of the time, we're just stuck on the network. And not, we're, we're not, not doing anything excessive there, like we're not parsing bytes, we're just literally waiting on the network, right? So 70% of the time, we're just <coughs> stuck. 6% uh, of the time, or 7% of the time, round it up, we're, par we're executing JavaScript. And then there's layout and paint and all the other suspects that you would expect to show up on this sort of breakdown. But the takeaway here is network is dominating the initial load time. Right? And anything we can do to optimize that is a big win. So there's a lot of things we can do here uh, to optimize network efficiency. The, I've mentioned a few of these. You know, placing bits closer to the user, using a CDN. That's never been as important. Uh, you can use any of the commercial vendors. You can roll your own. You know, there's plenty of cloud services around. Uh, many different ways to achieve this. Uh, shipping fewer bits. It still surprises me how many sites on the web today don't use compression. Um, and it's it's kind of sad. I mean, it's it's a it's a flag in your config file, and you should make sure that it's uh, it's there. And similarly, caching. And we'll see some examples uh, later. Uh, reusing connections, huge, huge area for optimization. Optimizing TLS for those that are running secure uh, connections. Uh, lots of work to be done there. And uh, things like redirects. Uh, redirects have no place in this equation of breaking 1,000 milliseconds. You should be eliminating all of them. Uh, so you know, how do we go about that? So I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to say, well, I did write a book uh, on this entire thing, and, and just point you there, because otherwise uh, it'll take me way longer than the time I have here to explain all those things. And O'Reilly actually has uh, the book online for free. So if you haven't picked up a copy, you can actually read it online. So all the stuff is there. I'll, uh, I'll let you uh, check that out. What I want to get to is the critical rendering path. So what is this idea, and, and what do we do to optimize for it? So Let's start with a very, very simple example, right? Like this was the toy example. This is actually a valid HTML5 markup, believe it or not. Um, it works. So we just have one page with Hello World on a page, and we have one external style sheet. 
And we want to render this, right? Like this should be loading in like 10 milliseconds or something like that, right? It's, it's the simplest page in the world. Well, it turns out it's actually much more complicated than that. Uh, first of all, let's say we're, start, we're starting to receive this data from the server, and the server just sent us the first three lines. Now, this is kind of a silly example. It's a very short example, but you could imagine that if you have a large file, you just get the first 10 kilobytes, right? So I'm just kind of splitting that window, and I'm saying, you got the first chunk. You parse that, and you say, well, great, I've got you know, my title, but I can't really render anything yet, right? I, I can't output anything to the screen. All of you received some HTML, and I've started constructing the DOM. We're doing... Uh, incremental. As we get these bytes off the wire, we're constructing the DOM in parallel. Next, uh, we get the next chunk, and we discover that there's this link tag, which points to an external resource, right? And at that point, we've received all of the DOM, but we still can't paint anything, uh, because if we paint without styles, we're, you're just going to get some ugly-looking page, right? And then we'd get the styles, and we would update it, and it's just a terrible user experience. I'm pretty sure that most of us have actually seen this, at some point where the connection has failed and your CSS didn't load and you just have this like white page with a bunch of I don't know what and then you have to refresh the page that's what we're trying to avoid right so we hold all the painting of the page until we have the CSS and at this point we've just discovered it so we say great we'll send the request for the CSS so now, so now we've chained this uh, dependency right we have the HTML now we have to fetch the CSS <laughs> so let's say for sake of example we also get partial CSS we can't do anything, right? We, we, we can't even construct the CSS uh, partially. We need to receive the entire document. Only when we, can, when, we, when we get the entire CSS file, or all of your CSS files, that's more, a more likely scenario, can we then combine those two things and say, well, here's the DOM, here are the style rules that you've declared, and actually, in the style rules, you know, I'm being clever here, I'm saying the span should be a display none. So, in fact, it's not a hello world, it's just a hello that you should print right, on the page. So this is the correctness part of it. So the takeaway here is this, this is the critical rendering path. Right? We have the DOM, or we have the HTML, and CSS. And those two things are linked uh, to paint something on the screen. Except I've kind of skipped something. Right? I, I picked a very simple example. But of course, we also have our friend and foe JavaScript, right? which is we can increasingly construct more and more of our pages via JavaScript with the help of JavaScript. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it certainly poses some challenges uh, to us. For example, here, uh, this, the JavaScript itself could also uh, manipulate the HTML, the markup, and it could also manipulate the styles, right? Because in my CSS, or sorry, in my JavaScript, I could say, what is the style of this element? Oh, it's not bold? Let me bold that. And then let me write some new content into the HTML. So similarly, you can see how now we have this dependency graph of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And those three things are linked, in fact. right? The JavaScript can modify the CSS. And because of that, all three of those are considered critical resources. This is why when you put CSS and JavaScript in the head of your document, we will block all rendering, basically, until we have all of those things and we've executed them. So the question is, do you need all of those things in the head of your document? Right? That analytics beacon probably has no business doing, you know, being in the head of your document because it's not uh, manipulating the page and it will block the rendering of your page. So this is kind of the end-to-end -end view. This is the critical rendering path. We get bytes from the network. We have HTML. We have CSS. JavaScript is doing something in between. It's manipulating the DOM. It's manipulating the CSS. Finally, we construct the render tree, which is that final output that goes to the screen. We do a layout and we do a paint. And I didn't talk about these steps, but uh, practically speaking, you should reserve at least 100 milliseconds on mobile for this step, which is to say we have this, all this information. We, we now need to do our work on the browser side to render the actual page, right? And that takes time to transfer all of the stuff to the GPU, get the GPU to paint it on the screen, et cetera. So the three simple things uh, that you can do to optimize for this is, first of all, stream the HTML, right? I mentioned that we do partial construction. Like, we, you, you send us the first chunk of HTML, we can parse that. So don't hold the HTML until you have all of it, you know, all X kilobytes of it. The moment you have something, give it to us. Um, a clever example that I like, I like to use is Google Search. Uh, we, when you send us a query uh, on Google Search, we don't even wait to parse the query. We get a request and we say, here, have the header. And then once you have the header of the page, we start in the background. We start, we're then evaluating the actual query, querying the index, and then servicing the rest of it. Right? And the header is basically fixed. 
Like it is customized to you because it has your name and other things, but that's populated via JavaScript. So the HTML is always fixed. And that's, you know, that's a clever trick. It allows the browser to start fetching resources as early as possible, and that's something that you could do as well. Not a trivial thing to do, but something you can do. Um, you definitely want to make sure that you get the CSS down to the client as fast as you can. So if you've ever heard the rule of place your CSS at the top, JavaScript at the bottom, this is why. You want to make sure that CSS is discovered as early as possible, such that we start fetching it as early as possible, such that we can unblock painting uh, of the page. And uh, eliminate blocking JavaScript. Uh, I find way too many pages uh, where there's a, you know, we just have this best practice, I guess, to some degree, where people just put all of their JavaScript declarations at the top of the head, like that's where it's supposed to live, right? And uh, more often than not, half of those scripts have no business of being in the critical rendering path, but effectively that's what you're doing. So um, I want to show you a little demo. So this is a tool that we've been working on at, uh, at Google uh, called PageSpeed Insights. And uh, let me see, let me make this smaller. And I figured, you know, since we're at Velocity, I'm going <laughs> to pick on Velocity uh, site at the risk of having them pull me off the stage here. Um, <laughs> so first of all, okay, so uh, you can come to this tool, you can basically just type in the, uh, any URL. In this case, I'm actually doing the schedule because I think a lot of us have been checking the schedule. And what we do is we basically look at the page, we render it both in the mobile and desktop uh, browsers, and we give you a score. So first of all, looking at this screenshot right here, I can tell you that it's not mobile optimized in the sense that you need to zoom, zoom around, you need to pinch zoom, and then find your way around it, right? So that's kind of a first telltale sign. But then, you know, let me expand this, and it has 10 blocking JavaScript and CSS resources. So these are resources that are found in the head of the document, right? So there is, uh, and I see <laughs> Courtney's smiling here. Um, <laughs> all right, so maybe they'll fix it. So you know, here's a lot of stuff, uh, jQuery, jQuery UI, jQuery form. Do you really need the form uh, in your critical rendering path, the conversion script? Uh, you kind of get my point, right? Now you know what, what I mean when I say critical, right? This, is, this will block your rendering. Similarly, there's a lot of CSS files. Some of those could be maybe deferred until later. Uh, let me see, so that's one. Uh, two is, turns out when we actually analyze this page, we say prioritize visible content. And what this tells you is that even though we've had all the HTML, turns out there's stuff on the page or JavaScript or some other things that is responsible for constructing the rest of the page such that if, if you just gave me the HTML, I wouldn't even be able to give you meaningful output, right? So there is, basically we're constructing part of the page in JavaScript. That in itself is not necessarily a bad thing, but it will defer how quickly we can display it. Uh, this one really got me. Uh, turns out uh, we're actually not caching CSS and other things. So, yeah, uh, we have some optimization to do. Uh, mo moving on, yes. Uh, New York Times. So, um, I rendered this and it tells me, hey, you should probably switch to the mobile version of ad1times.com. Like, really? Why don't you just send me there? Uh, like, I, I don't see how this is a good experience, but that's, okay, anyway. So similarly, seven blocking scripts, a bunch of JavaScript, a bunch of CSS, uh, also not caching a lot, yeah, uh, not compressing some things, and also not optimizing images. So lots of handy tips in here that you can test, and of course, I did test actually the mobile site that it told me to, uh, to go to, and that site actually scores quite well. So the question is just, why don't you serve the right site to begin with, right? Like, that's, that's not a good experience. Uh, which actually get, gets back to something that we're working on now. So this tool you can use today, you can play with it. It's actually, it's very useful for identifying the big performance bottlenecks on your site. And what we're thinking about now on the PageSpeed Insights front is performance is not just about, you know, how quickly we can paint, but also was it useful what we've painted, right? Like, we should be able to, you should be outputting useful pixels to the screen. Uh, and how do you go about that? Well, first of all, uh, as you saw in the example, for example, Velocity site, you know, news.y combinator, or, um, when you first render this page, I would actually argue that this is not very useful. This is not user friendly at all because I can't actually tell anything what's on the page. I need to pinch zoom, I need to pan around, and it's just not a good user experience. So if I was measuring this in terms of like, I wanted to answer, I wanted to get the, 
answer to what are the breaking news, this is, uh, it takes me quite a while to get to, that, to, to find that answer, right? So the things that we will be evaluating soon or be, we'll be adding to PageSpeed Insights are things like making sure that your site is not using plugins for obvious reasons, right? Because mobile browsers don't support plugins. Uh, things like making sure that you start with the mobile viewport, layout viewport, such that you don't, you're not forcing your users to zoom around and pinch zoom and do all this kind of, kind of other stuff. Uh, the content should fit into the viewport, that the text is legible, that I don't have to overwrite it in my settings, and then make, making sure that buttons are actually sized to appropriate size on mobile, right? It's so annoying when you have to kind of like hunt and peck and then you click the wrong thing and you lost your form or something. It is a terrible experience. So kind of according to these uh, criteria, this site on the left that I have here uh, for Y Combinator is just a fail grade, right? Terrible experience. But I think where we ultimately want to, where we want to get to is we want to start thinking in round trips. And kind of here, here's an early prototype of how we've been thinking about it, which is you know we're picking on yet another site here, and we're saying it takes about nine round trips uh, to render this page. And that's independent. So this, the, the reason this is useful is because this is independent of the network that you're on, right? Like if you're on a 3G network, and your RTT is 400 milliseconds, well, that's three and a half seconds, or 3.6 seconds, which explains some of the kind of terrible experience that we end up with today. And if you happen to be on a, on a 4G network, yes, it will be faster, but fundamentally, you're limited by the number of RTTs. And those RTTs are driven by what's in your critical rendering path, how you structured your page, where did you place your JavaScript. So in this case, we're actually highlighting that you know at this stage, we're blocked on JavaScript, JavaScript, JavaScript. Then for some reason, maybe the JavaScript scheduled a CSS download. We're blocked on CSS. And then finally, you know, we, we paint something, but useful content shows up after nine. Ideally, useful content would show up on one, right? That's, that's our holy grail. That's our goal. That's not to say that you know, every page can be rendered in one. I hope it can. I think it can. But you know, maybe you can uh, look at your page like this and say, like, well, we have a 12 RTT render. Can we get it down to nine? Can we get it down to eight? And what, you know, what do we lose in the process, or what do we gain in the process? So the observation here is we're not talking about rendering the full page, right? We're talking about rendering the above the fold. And that's an important distinction. So is there content on your page? Can you inline certain parts of the page? Can you inline certain parts of CSS or JavaScript? You, know, there, you may have JavaScript that is executing, that is populating stuff below the fold. Well, maybe you can execute that later. So that's where we want to get to. We want to make sure that reliably, when you click on the link, you get useful information on your screen within one second. But you can be progressively filling in the rest of the page after that. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's where we're heading. That's where uh, a lot of our apps at Google are heading. So uh, to do that, you need to do things like eliminate redirects. Right? Uh, there's just no room for red uh, redirects here, because they cause uh, if you send it to a different subdomain, that's a different DNS lookup, that's a new TCP connection. If you're an SSL, we're, like, we're just repeating that entire cycle all over. So terrible experience. And uh, basically, the way you want to think about this is think in round trips. Like uh, When I showed you that uh, silly page with just one style sheet, right? basically, you should be thinking that's a two RTT page, because there's the HTML and there's an external CSS file. So I know that's a two RTT page. And when I added a JavaScript file, well, maybe I can do those in parallel. Right? So that's still maybe a two RTT page. But if I'm then scheduling other resources from my JavaScript, that's a three RTT page. And you can see how this kind of logic applies and how you should think about optimizing for it. You also want to defer all non-critical things. Like if you have analytics, fire it after the first paint. Right? Please, uh, don't, don't wait to fire your uh, analytics beacons before you render something. because likelihood is you're actually going to just lose the user. You're going to fire the beacon, the user will hit back, and that's not a good user experience. Uh, this applies to JavaScript and CSS, and um, you should actually consider inlining. Uh, perhaps you know, we, we only have a limited amount of room, 14 kilobytes. Can we inline the critical JavaScript and CSS? Like, What is it that you need to bootstrap your page? That's what we're after. Uh, not an easy thing to do, but something to think about. So here's kind of a very simple but Hence one example, right? You start with a page like this, which is kind of how we've been taught to build web pages. You have a style sheet, and you have an application, and just have a, a main body class. 
So what we want to do is, if you want to make this a one RTT render, right? Like if we want to, to do a one RTT render, the only thing we can count on is HTML. No other requests allowed. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, you know what? I know that I'm going to have my nav bar and I'm going to have my whatever, you know, main section. So I'm just going to inline a part of my CSS. That's the critical part of my CSS directly into the page. And I'm going to load the rest after the onload. Similarly, for scripts, I can inline my bootstrap code and then defer it later. Now, that may or may not be applicable to your site. You can maybe get away with a 2RTT render. But these are the trade-offs that you should be thinking about. All right, so we have some function at the end that basically says, after you've painted, uh, let's load the rest. So here's an example. This is uh, actually an example from modphp.com. And uh, we've been working on tools to try and automate this, uh, both for deferring JavaScript and inlining CSS. So here's a page. You can actually try this yourself. If you go to modphp.com, we have a list of filters, and we have a before and an after. So what, all I'm doing here is rendering that same page in web page test. This is the exact same page. And what it has is it's an HTML file with six, uh, yes, six, six uh, CSS files. And in the first case, we're just doing exactly what you would expect. In the head of the document, we're putting six style sheet links. And you can see that we've loaded the HTML. Then we load, we wait to load all the six CSS files. And this is when the first render happens, right? This green line in web page test tells you when the first render happens. And I'm simulating this on a 3G connection, I believe. You can check the web page test link um, later. And it takes us four and a half seconds, just because that's, that's the nature of the game, right? We have to wait for all the CSS. But if we apply some smarts to this problem and you say, well, there's six CSS files, yes, but I only need a portion of that CSS to render the actual useful content, I will inline that. We can paint 1.3 seconds in, right? Which is a world of a difference. This is going from a typical, unfortunately, user experience on the web today, of like roughly three to five seconds on mobile, to a fast site. And this is not exactly rocket science. So we do have uh, plugins for this. For example, we have Mod PageSpeed and Nginx PageSpeed, which, is, uh, which apply these optimizations on the fly uh, in Apache and Nginx. We have this filter called Prioritize Critical CSS. And what it does is basically determine what is the critical CSS. We actually have some, uh, a beacon mechanism where we gather this data from the users. So initially, when you start loading the page, we have no idea what is the critical CSS. So we will let the users render the page. We'll actually inject some extra JavaScript code to gather what is above the fold, beacon it back to the server, and then use that feedback to drive uh, further optimization. So uh, it's really clever stu uh, stuff. And um, actually, Jan from the PHP team gave a talk to earlier today about how we do this. So if you guys uh, didn't get a chance to attend that talk, I encourage you to check out the slides. And I think the video will be online later. Or just go to the mod PHP site and play with it. So it is possible to automate this kind of thing. And then finally, um, you know, I I've hinted at this idea of we can cheat. We can cheat. We can change. OK, we can, uh, can change the, uh, the rules of the game, which is perhaps we don't have to wait um, for user input, right? Uh, there is a number of things that the browser provides today. This is available to you. Uh, some of these are not available in all the browsers, but these are some of the tricks that you can use. For example, uh, let's say you're scheduling resources from JavaScript for whatever reason, right? Because we can't, the browser can't discover those quickly, uh, you can actually add the DNS prefetch tag, which basically says, look, I'm going to be requesting stuff from this domain later, so please pre-resolve this name for me for whatever reason, right? And you can just put that in the head of your document, and we will, we will do that on your behalf. Uh, Sub-resource. So this is a Chrome-only optimization, but it basically says, look, I will, you, you give it the actual name of the file, and you're saying, look, I, will, I know I will need this file later on this page, so please start fetching it now. Right? So basically, uh, you're, you're not saying which type of file. You're just initiating that transfer immediately. And then later, when we discover it, uh, we will just fall back to the, resource, to the connection or the request that's already in progress. Prefetch, on the other hand, is something that happens in the future. So you're, you're on page A, and you think you will need page B or a resource on page B. So this is for future navigation. You're basically saying, look, uh, 
the users on the checkout page, I'm going to need this thing on the thank you page or something to that extent. So go ahead and fetch that for me, please. And finally, we have the pre-render, which is basically like prefetch, except it's, it's the full shebang, if you will, right? Basically, we're saying render this page in a background tab, and then when the user clicks on it, we'll just swap it in, and it'll be an instant page load. And Chrome and, as of recently, IE11 support pre-render, which is awesome when you can make it work. So there we can eliminate all latency, right? It should be just like you click on the link, you get instant feedback, which is exactly what you want. And I think I'm getting the, uh, the hook here. So we're on the last slide. This is just a summary of you know, some of the issues or some of the challenges that we need to think about. So first, there's input latency, hardware and software. You can eliminate software. You need to be aware of the radio and carrier latency. You definitely need to optimize the routing and the transport stuff. And you know, I cheated there, and I just said, go read my book. It's good stuff. <laughs> and render latency, that's the critical rendering path. Uh, this is something that you really need to think about. Uh, you, need, you need to th start thinking about RTTs and resources and how those two things go together. And uh, with that, the link to the slides are there. And I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'll be around in any case so you guys can, can ask me. All right, thank you.